All right, welcome back. Chemistry 111, guys. We've got an exam coming up, and I've got another video answer key for you, and so hopefully this helps you build your confidence and get some uh, last-minute questions answered or maybe a little bit more practice in before the exam. So let's go ahead and dive right in. And again, if you've got you know a lot of these things uh, where you feel very comfortable, you're welcome to skip around on this video and, and concentrate on the parts that are, are giving you a hard time. So okay, this first one's about nomenclature, right? Naming compounds is really important. In order to do that, I think you really gotta keep in mind whether things are ionic or covalent, right? And so this first one, we've got calcium, which is a metal, and this polyatomic group here, that's a bunch of non-metals, so this is gonna be ionic, right? Now we don't have to put it in there, I know it didn't ask for it, but it's a good thing to know because ionic naming is different than covalent naming and so for ionic naming first we name the metal and so we'll look here and we'll say what calcium so there's calcium and then what is this one this looks like phosphate but phosphate is PO4 this is phosphite right so this is important phosphite because it has the the three here as opposed to the four and so calcium phosphate phosphite excuse me um, in this case, we've got uh, a bunch of nonmetals here, so this is going to be a covalent or a molecular compound, and so this one is using the prefixes. So we have di nitrogen, right? And then three for the oxygen, we call this trioxide. Those are really easy. Covalent compounds are pretty simple. Now we're taking uh, the opposite approach. I'm going to give you a name and have you write, write the formula. Again, this is ammonium sulfate. This is ionic compound. And ammonium, right, is NH4. And you have to know this whole thing is a plus one charge. Sulfate is SO4, and that's two minus. So in order for these to balance out, we need two of these ammoniums to balance the two minus. Uh, sulfate and there we go there's ammonium sulfate sulfur dioxide well that's a covalent compound right and so this is very simple there's one sulfur oftentimes people don't put mono for sulfur so if there's no prefix it just means one and we've got the term di here meaning two so there's sulfur dioxide pretty simple good warm-up make sure you're good on those because you know you're gonna see some of those problems on the exam and, and I hope these should be uh, kind of a good way to start the exam because it should uh, help you build some confidence because this is pretty straightforward and you can really uh, put some points in the bank so to speak. Okay, this next one deals with Lewis structures, right? So it says, okay, we want to draw all the Lewis structures here for this first one and here, note that whenever you see something that's ion, please circle it. Both of these are ions so you don't forget at the end to make sure it's charged. Here with uh, this um, you got the iodine, right? That's going to be 7 plus 3 times 6 is 18 plus one more because anion. And this should tell you that you have 26 electrons. On an exam, please take extra time and make sure you've done your addition or subtraction correctly because you really need to make sure you add those electrons up because if you get this wrong, there's no way you're going to get the right Lewis structure. So we know in this case the iodine's in the middle and we've got three oxygen so we have to at least connect them somehow using a single bond and that takes up two, four, six um, electrons which means we have um, 20 left so I can go around and go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. That leaves two left and you'll notice here the iodine does not have an octet, so we put those there. And then you need to make sure to put the bracket around it to indicate that it is a charged ion. And if you look here, there's really no need um, for any kind of um, uh, special throwing in extra bonds or any kind of weird stuff like this. But we, we do want to label our non-zero formal charges, so let's go ahead and do that. And we know it has to equal that negative one because all the charges in here have to add up to that. Um, if you look at the oxygen right, um, you say, okay, we've got oxygen, that's going to be 6 minus 6 minus 1, so that's a negative 1, which means all of these are negative 1. And then the iodine, if you're going to think about here, you can either calculate it or you can figure out that it's got to be a positive 2 because it has to have the negative balance out these negatives to equal only negative 1. So 1, 2, 3, negative 3 positive 2 is negative 1 or you could say iodine 7 valence electrons minus 2 is 5 minus 1 2 3 is 2 so there you go now if you want to I know some of you I didn't 
I didn't really tell you you had to worry about um, you know um, octet rule versus formal charge so if you wanted to you could make one of these auctions a double bond right and that would bring this one to zero and this one to a positive one and you could probably add another one and play with the formal charges to get them uh, reduced but for right now um, you know if you want to go by octet rule this is perfectly fine if you want to go by formal charges you could start building some double bonds and again only build in those double bonds if it makes sense don't start just throwing in double bonds just because you feel like it it's not a good way to go so there's a lot of latitude here you could have drawn a bunch of different structures for this one and it would have been perfectly fine now we want to look at the molecular geometry so we have one two three four electron domain regions or EDRs and this is going to be based off of the tetrahedron right so we're going to go ahead and draw I'm going to go ahead and uh, put my lone pair up here so I don't forget about it I'm going to put one of my floor, uh, oxygens over here, I'm going to put one of my oxygens over here, and then finally I'm going to put an oxygen over there. And that kind of looks like a tetrahedron, right? Um, let me kind of scribble that out. There we go. Looks pretty good. And if you look at this, you say, what are the bond angles? Well, roughly, if you look at that, that should be about 109.5 degrees. Are there going to be any deviations? Well, yeah, this lone pair uh, this non-bonding pair is going to push, it's going to repel these bonding pairs a little bit more. So down here, these iodine, or oxygen, iodine, and oxygen bonds are going to shrink a little bit. So you could say something like, it's going to be a little bit less than 109.5 uh, due to the lone pair. And in polar and nonpolar, well, these are clearly going to be polar bonds. They're pointing in a common direction, so it's going to give us some polarity. And so we say that's going to be polar. All right, for this other one over here, we see we've got... Um, this arsenic right here, which is going to be what? It's going to be 5 plus 4 times 7. Okay, that's 28 plus one more. And I get what? I get 34 ish for that. I'm going to go ahead and just connect them. Now remember, Lewis structures, you don't have to have any three dimensional um, information in a Lewis structure, right? It's just a two dimensional connectivity. And so let's go ahead and crank this one out. I've got 34 minus 1, 2, 3, 4. I've got 8 used up there. And then I need to go ahead and say, okay, let's go around and give all these outer guys a octet. We can do that. That's not too hard. Pen is behaving today, so I can actually draw dots, which is nice. And then we look at all this and we say, what do we have? Well, we've got, what, 8? Looks like we've got 32, so we need two more here for this lone pair on arsenic and then we need to go ahead and draw the charge for that whole thing and again you want to label any non-zero formal charges if you look at the fluorine single bond fluorine is going to be seven minus six minus one so all these fluorines are are zero which means that in order for this to be a negative this arsenic needs to be a negative charge or you could say arsenic is what five minus two minus four and that's a negative one so you get the same answer either way now there's one, two, three, four, five electron domain regions. So this is based off of the um, trigonal bipyramid structure, right? So we uh, look at that, and these are the axial positions, right? The 180 degrees apart are axial, and we never put a lone pair in the axial positions. And now we can fill in our equatorial positions, kind of the spokes of a wheel. And then we can put our lone pair up here, right? And if you look at that, if you kind of hide the lone pair, it looks like a little seesaw. And so seesaw is the geometry, and that's one of the ones you should know. And if you think about the bond angles, right? Well, this fluorine fluorine bond will be about 90, and then um, this fluorine fluorine should be 120 based on the difference between equatorial and axial. But again, the lone pair is going to push a little bit more, so I'd say it'd be a little bit less than 90 and a little bit less than 120 because that lone pair is going to repel a little bit more. So the lone pair repels the bonding pairs and they kind of squinch in a little bit. Again, these fluorine arsenic bonds are going to be polarized towards the fluorine and they're all kind of pointing down here. These two probably cancel each other out. These two are pointing roughly in this down direction. So I'm going to say this is a polar molecule. And there's more about that in your book if you're confused about polarity. But these look pretty good. We're going to go ahead and move on to the next one. This next one says, okay, we've got this weird structure you've never seen before, and I'm going to have you complete the Lewis structure. And again, it says right here, be careful about not violating the octet rule, right? And I've given you kind of a skeletal structure, but I would say it's important, you know, to maybe count still. So 
I'm going to go ahead and count this one. I've got 7 for the chlorine, plus 6 for the oxygen, plus 5 for the nitrogen. I get, I think, what, 18 electrons? It's always worth counting. And now we can look at this and we can say, okay, let's start over here and kind of finish this out. We only have four electrons accounted for here, two here and two here. So we got 14 left. I'm going to go ahead and give the outer atoms their octet. And that leaves only two left. So I'm going to go ahead and put them on the nitrogen here. And you'll see very quickly what's the problem. Well, the nitrogen does not have an octet. And it says, do not violate the octet rule. So in this case, we've got a choice, right? We can either, um, I don't know, we can put a double bond with the chlorine or a double bond with the oxygen. Well, that has different consequences. Um, I'm probably going to pick this one over here. And so get rid of this lone pair. And now if I do this, I can look at my formal charges. And the chlorine, I've got 7 minus 6 minus 1. That's 0. Nitrogen, 5 minus 2 minus 3. That's 0. Oxygen, 6 minus 4 minus 2, 0. So boom, boom, boom. I could have gone with this chlorine over here, but then I would have had some issues with my formal charges, right? So for this structure, this arrangement where I put the nitrogen in the middle, this one was given to me. I had to kind of make the best structure um, for this arrangement, and I think this is the best one by formal charge, and I did not violate the octet rule. Now, this structure over here, this is interesting. They, in this one, you had the nitrogen in the middle. In this structure, they give you the oxygen in the middle. So these are not, right? They're not resonance structures. Resonance structures only move electrons. They don't move atoms. This is two completely different structures two completely different arrangement of atoms. And so um, I've got to be careful about realizing that. So these are not resonance structures. And so in this one, I've got, again, um, the same number of electrons. So I'm going to go ahead and solve it the same way. Put my non-bonding pairs around here. And then I've got one left in the middle here. And you could say, OK, well, I could, again, put the, um, the charge here. But if I did that, that would have some interesting formal charge arguments, right? And so. Um, you know, let's let's go ahead and see what would happen. Let's let's go ahead and make a bad choice, maybe. Okay, so if we did that, we know here we've got chlorine, right? Seven minus four minus two, which would be what? Seven minus four is three minus two. That's a positive charge on chlorine. That's probably not going to be a very good idea. So I'm going to stop there and get rid of that mistake. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to say, okay, let's go back to where we were, and I'm going to put the double bond over here instead and let's see what happens. Chlorine has zero, oxygen is going to be a plus one and nitrogen is going to be a negative one. That's a little bit better, right? Because nitrogen doesn't mind have a negative. Better than having a positive on chlorine, that's not so good. And if we look at these, okay, we have to say which one is, is the better, most stable structure? Well, I would say that by putting the nitrogen in the middle, this structure is better because the formal charges are minimized, right? We've got all zero formal charges. That's really, really stable. That looks good compared to this one. Now, this one's not terrible, right? Because you've got um, very small formal charges, plus and a minus. I don't know how, mu how much uh, oxygen's going to uh, enjoy having a positive charge on itself because it's a pretty electronegative element as is nitrogen. But I'd say this one is you know, it's not as good as this one, so I would have circled this one. Kind of a neat problem there. This next one deals with hybridization, right? So we talk about um, our valence bond structures, and these are pretty easy. If you look here, you say, okay, well, I have to have uh, 180 degrees, and how do I get 180 degrees? Well, I use two orbitals. I use S and a P, and I become SP hybridized, and the bond angle, I already told you, is 180. Or you could have said, I've got two EDRs, and so SP is a kind of convenient mnemonic device, but I really don't want you to rely on that. Over here, we see this is a tetrahedral arrangement, so I need 109.5 degrees. In order to get 109.5, I've got to use an S and not one, not two, but three P orbitals, and that's the only way you get 109.5. And then finally, this one right here, this is roughly 120 degrees, and the only way you get 120 is by taking an s orbital and hybridizing it with not one, but two um, p orbitals, and that gives you 120. 
Again, hybridization is linked to the bond angle that you need in order to explain the geometry that you have. And we talked about that in class. All right, this next one, we're looking at bonding in this molecule over here, right? So this is a C2H4. This is ethylene, a really neat molecule. And I think the important thing here to look at is that's 120 degrees. So that means each of these carbons, yeah, both of them, oops, there we go. Both of them are going to be sp2 hybridized. So if you look at that, you can say, okay, I want to draw a carbon-hydrogen bond. Remember, hydrogens only have 1s orbitals. You can't hybridize hydrogens because they only have one orbital filled at the ground level at the most relaxed orbital uh, state. And so we're going to say, uh, most uh, sorry, most relaxed energy state, rather. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of use this picture over here, and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to draw my carbon. And I want to draw a carbon-hydrogen bond. So remember, sp2, you form 1, 2, 3. And remember, those are going to be sp2. You form three of them. And then over here, I'm going to go ahead and change colors, if you'll allow me to do that. Um, and I'm going to say for a hydrogen, we'll have this s orbital. And that's going to be a, an s orbital, right? And then if you look at that, well, at the overlap, that's where you form the bond. And that's a sigma bond, right? That direct interaction between the uh, nuclei along that direct path, that's what we call sigma. That's really important. The next one wants us to draw a sigma bond between the two carbons. Well, that's pretty easy. We still draw our um, three sp2 orbitals. I'm going to draw another carbon down here. Right there right there, right there, and that's going to be a sp2. And if you look at the overlap, right, the overlap here, again, is between, directly between the carbons. So again, that's a sigma bond. And then the last one's a little bit more complicated, drawing a pi bond, right? So we had sigma in this case, we had sigma in this case, now we want to see a pi bond. And pi bonds are quite a, kind of unique because of the fact that they are um, going to be above and below overlap. And so I'm going to draw my p orbital, which is probably a little bit big, right? Because we had sp2, that means we used an s and two of the p orbitals. We all know there are three p orbitals in a subshell. So this is the p orbital that didn't get to do anything, was not hybridized. And so we have an electron in each. And then just like in the cases before, you get the overlap above and below sharing in the case, uh, sorry, we had one electron in, in all of these. I can go ahead and draw those back in. There we go, that's better. So two electrons in each case. But what's unique about this one is that the bonding is above and below, not directly between, right? The sigma bond is in this region here, and up above and below is the pi. And it's important to make the distinction that this whole pi interaction, this above and below pi interaction, right? We've got to get rid of this guy down here. But it's important to realize that that is one bond. That is one pi bond, and that's really important. So when you draw this bond here, you see one bond is the sigma. So in this case, the sigma plus the pi, all that equals the carbon-carbon double bond. Right? That's pretty neat. All right, more structures down here. First, we see a nitrate ion and it's asking for three resonance structures okay so resonance right is moving electrons but not moving atoms and so we're going to say five for the nitrogen plus 18 plus one more and that gives me what that gives me 24 electrons i'll go ahead and start right here and i'm going to lock these in position here and I've got six there, so there's 18 left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. Um, in this case, the nitrogen, there are no more electrons left, and nitrogen is a little bit shy of the octet it needs. So in order to give it an octet, we've got to pick one of these uh, lone pair electrons, these non-bonding, and convert them into a bond. And so we'll go ahead and put that in there, cover that up. And then please don't forget your bracket because this whole thing is charged, as you can see here. Now, it doesn't say to do this, but I'm going to go ahead and label my formal charges because I think it's really important. It's always kind of a good habit to do that. 
Now notice we picked this one, or I picked this one over here, but you could have equally picked this one or this one over here, and that's what a resonance structure is. Resonance structure, we do not move atoms. We do not change their identity. We only move the electrons. And by doing that, we can say, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, plus 6 is 24, so we didn't miscount. I'll put the bracket over there. And in this case, I'll go up top. I'll get rid of this lone pair and I'll convert it into a double bond. So now nitrogen has an octet. Good to go there. I'll put my formal charges in here. Easy enough. And then we've done this oxygen, this oxygen. We need to do the, the last one. And I think you can see here, you've probably gotten the pattern. We put our bracket around it. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. I'll cross out this lone pair and put a little bond in there. Now we've got our formal charges. There we go. So three unique resonance structures, totally different. And here it says, estimate the average nitrogen oxygen bond order. Well, let's just pick one, right? So I'm just going to pick. Um, Oh, that color, that pen didn't work very well. Let's try this again. Let's go. There we go. I'm going to pick one of my bonds. I'm going to pick this one right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to concentrate on that one. And I'm going to say, OK, if I want to find the average bond order, in this case, the bond order is two because there are two bonds. I'm going to say there's two in this one, right? Two. In this case, I have to pick the same bond. There's only one. In this case, I have to pick the same bond. There's only one. 2 plus 1 plus 1 divided by the total number of Lewis structures and so this is 4 thirds which you can say is roughly equal to 1 and a third right or 1 and 1 third so if you look at it the average of this is what's the actual uh, probably more accurate depiction it's not any one of these it's probably an average and in this case these are all equally good Lewis structures so they all equally contribute so I'm gonna say this bond order is roughly one and a third right it's gonna be somewhere in between a double bond and a single bond but probably closer to a single bond given the one third there and we talked about an example like this in class in fact we might have done this exact same one so it's really good practice all right the last page is more computational but I think it's important so here we've got an unknown sample of lactic acid, and unless you're just a, you know, a chemistry savant, you probably don't remember what the exact formula for that is, and that's okay, because you don't need to remember it, you can solve for it. So we want to find the empirical formula, which is the lowest whole number ratio of the atoms, and so we've given our, our percent uh, elements by mass, and I'm going to go ahead and assume uh, 100 grams, just to make this a little bit easier for me, so I'm going to write in the 100 grams of this compound, since it's 40%, you're going to have 40 grams of carbon. And we can convert grams to moles. So we'll say 1 mole of carbon is 12.01 grams of carbon. And when I do that, I get something on the order of 3.33 moles of carbon. Now make sure to write your units. It's really important. you got to get everything labeled to get full credit. And then for the hydrogen, if I have 100 grams, I'm going to have 6.71 grams of hydrogen. And for every one mole of hydrogen, I'm going to have 1.01 grams of hydrogen. In that case, I get 6.64 moles of hydrogen. And the last one is oxygen. For every 100 grams of this compound, 53.29 grams is oxygen. And you can look on the PREAC table and see that for every one mole of oxygen, you have 16.00 grams of oxygen. And that gives me 33.33 moles of oxygen. Now, this doesn't really help you much. You need to essentially try to find a ratio. So I'm going to pick oxygen or carbon. It doesn't matter which. I'm going to divide by the smallest number. So if I do that, I get a 1 here. If I do this, I get a, um, let's see, that's about 2, right? And this one I get 3.33. Look at that, that's convenient. So now I can convert these. I have uh, one carbon, right? One carbon. 
I have two hydrogens per carbon and then I have one oxygen, a one to two to one whole number ratio. That is our empirical formula. Lowest whole number ratio, really important. Now down here it says, okay, if we know the actual molar mass is 90.08, we need to know what do we have to multiply. So if this is our lowest whole number ratio, the mass of that, or the empirical mass, is about 30.03 grams per mole. You can see probably really easily this goes into here three times. So we can take CH2O times three and you end up getting C3H6O3 and that's the structure of, of the compound. So that's, or the, sorry, that's the formula of the compound, the molecular formula. And that's the actual real number, the specific number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens in this lactic acid structure. Not the whole number ratio, that's empirical. We want the molecular formula, and that molecular formula has to add up to that molecular weight, which is really important. All right, the last one deals with a little bit of gas chemistry, and it will be all done with this uh, review packet. This first one says we've got a 1.35 gram sample of an unknown gas at this temperature and this pressure and this volume. What's the density? Well, density is really easy, right? Density is mass per volume, and in this case I want grams per liter. Well, this is not a trick. You go up here and you say there's 1.35 grams of that gas in 1.35 liters, and I was a little cheeky on this one, uh, 1.00 grams per liter. Some of you probably thought it was more complicated, but I think that was a really easy problem if you just thought about what density meant. So kind of a definition question. This one's really the same thing. It may seem kind of silly at first or complicated, but you need to know the mass per mole to find the molar mass. And if you think about gases, right, we always talk about the combined ideal gas law equals PV versus NRT. And if you look N, right, N is moles. So if we know the mass and we can calculate the moles, that will give us molar mass. So if we want to solve for N, we go N equals PV all over RT. And again, you got to show your units and show your calculations. And I'm going to say, okay, well, I've got 1.05 ATM of pressure. That's my P. Volume, 1.35 liters. And R is a gas constant. You'll be given that on your data sheet. 0 0.0821. And this has liters times ATM, right? Because it's got to cancel those above it over moles. Kelvin. And so if we want to cancel out that Kelvin to be left with moles, which is what we're trying to solve for, that temperature needs to be not in Celsius, but it needs to be in Kelvin. So you take the degree C and you add 273, and that gets us to Kelvin temperature. When you crank that out, I get something like 0 0.0570 moles, right? Because the ATMs cancel, the liters cancel, the Kelvin cancels, and you're only left with moles. That's why units are so important. And if you want to find the molar mass, right, the molar mass equals 1.35 grams. We got that from way up above, right? So you can bring that back down here. And then we take this value and we plug this in, 0 0.0570 moles. Now we're grams per mole, and I get 23.8 um, grams per mole. There you go. Hopefully that's not too tough. Um, you know, there's your final answer. It's it's not that scary. Um, make sure you got your units. Um, really, really important. Let units help you. For a lot of you, you don't want to take the time to put the units in there and paying attention to units and significant figures is going to be really important. So anyway, um, I, this video is getting a little bit long, so I'm going to shut it down, and hopefully this has been helpful. Um, you know, I hope you can you know, build up your confidence and, and really do well in this exam and, and feel good about how you're doing in the course. So anyway, uh, take care, and I'll see you in class or at the review session or at the exam.